Okay, friends, so get ready for it. Welcome to our 76th online gathering for congregational leaders across the country. This monthly gathering is called Courageous Leadership, and it's sponsored by ELCA's Coaching Ministry. I'm Jill Beverlin. I am so blessed to be the coordinator of coaching for the ELCA, and I'm one of your facilitators today. As a reminder, we are creating and holding a safe and brave space in these gatherings. We pray that you will bring the truth of who you are and how you are doing in this time. These conversations are an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us today as the body of Christ. So again, greetings and warm welcome to you. As I've opened, I've recently began using portions of a weekly newsletter um, that is written by our executive director for Christian Community and Leadership, the Reverend Dr. Phil Hirsch. And so today I'm going to read a paraphrase from one of Phil's most recently published articles. Phil begins, last week our Christian Community and Leadership team heard a presentation that was done by our innovation staff on Gen Z. While no study captures everything, this one had some very interesting findings. Some conclusions seem simple, like people feel loved when they're listened to, which is good to know that people's needs are in some ways still very basic. But here I want to challenge your assumptions about this generation and what you can learn from this study. All of us carry an understanding of the world and of the people we are trying to serve. That knowledge is collectively sustaining a church that is in deep decline. One way forward is to try to let go of what you think you know and listen with compassion to others to find out what they are really saying. Let me say this again, friends. One way forward is to try to let go of what you think you know and listen with compassion to others to find out what they are really saying. Phil ends this article by stating, and this takes intention and some good courage. So with these concepts swirling as a framework, I want to state again that we appreciate that you're here today, and we are so honored to welcome into our speaking space, Rebecca Malgren. Rebecca is ELCA's coordinator for economic diversity. She helps coordinate the ELCA Homeless and Justice Network, which is a growing group of over 30 leaders working with people experiencing homelessness across the country. She also coordinates an emerging group, which is called the ELCA Vulnerable and Vital Congregations. And these people are best strategically positioned to respond. Rebecca will be sharing with us about the amazing vitality and leadership coming from the margins in the ELCA. So with that, Becca, welcome to our speaking space. Hi, everyone. Um, I am so grateful to be here and thank you so much, um, Jill and Jason for the invitation and, um, and Jill for that amazing opening and it's so, um, um, it, that we, we talked before this started about just that, the word to listen and to listen. And I, um, I hope that that, um, is really lifted up by what I say, uh, today about what my hope is, um, for the leaders in these groups. Um, although I'm not Gen Z, um, if that's, I, I have a side part, so I think that was obvious. Um, so, um, um, okay, so I, my name is uh, Becca Mongren. I um, live in the suburbs of Chicago, um, and I work at the ELCA Churchwide Office, um, although I'm remote at the moment. Um, and I work part-time as the coordinator for economic diversity. Um, and I also, um, I, I actually was a music teacher first, so I, I um, I taught music for several, several years in the um, preschool through eighth grade, and I still teach music, um, but although I'm at a church. So I work at my church. I do children's choirs and musicals, and um, and so I there's um, all sorts of things going on in my life right now. I have two little ones, um, an eight-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, 
And so just navigating life in this new world, you know, has just been really um, interesting and hard and wonderful. And I'm sure a lot of you can understand that. So um, that's just a little bit about me. Um, and I um, am going to open this time by reading to you, um, reading to you a story. So um, as Jill mentioned, I get to work with this amazing group of people um, called the Homeless and Justice Network. Um, and um, Mary Wolf is here. I'm so excited because she's, <laughs> yay. Um, I, I have uh, these amazing friendships and people that I, I am honored and, and get to work with. Um, and so I would like to open by um, reading to you a story um, from one of the uh, pastors. So his name is uh, Pastor Matthew Best. Um, and he, um, let me pull it out for myself. Um, he is um, also from, or he's from Pennsylvania, from St. Stephen's Lutheran Church, um, and he has a church in a truck stop. So um, as he was um, um, noticing uh, the Flying J in his town, um, there were people um, that were experiencing homelessness that were hanging out in the Denny's. And so um, his, him and a few church members started um, going out there, giving, um, just providing for uh, the, the things that they needed, um, blankets and food and things for the children. And it wasn't before uh, too long that they started asking uh, for a church service. And so he, um, he did that. And so I'm going to read to you a story um, that he wrote, and um, it's it's just about a minute and a half long, uh, but I'm going to read it to you. It's a, it, It's been a really special story to me. Um, so this is in his words. So when I say I, um, th that really means him. Uh, Yesterday was another Flying J evening. In many ways, it was like any other night of ministry at Flying J. We had many different encounters. We did laundry. We ate with people. We worshipped. As a pastor, I often end up talking with a variety of people throughout the evening. One fellow was a bit of a challenge, but we did what we could for him. During the meal, we worshipped. We worshipped in Denny's. It is our sanctuary. It's a sanctuary in the midst of the rest of the world. We are called to be a light in the darkness. It just so happens to be a Denny's. During worship, we share the Eucharist often composed of a hamburger or a hot dog bun and some type of grape juice and a coffee mug. It is what I have available. Typically, my daughter comes along to help out through the, through the night and then to assist with communion. But tonight I asked if anyone else wanted to help. This time our waitress volunteered without knowing what to do. I gave her the cup and instructed her on how intinction works and what to say. And she followed me around the table as we gave the elements to people. And then we communed with each other. Afterwards, she spoke with me and shared what it was like. She shared that when she was going around offering the cup to people, she felt something change. It's emptying, she said. She meant that in a meaningful way, a release from the burdens of a kind of way. She felt the burdens that were around her just empty away. I thanked her for assisting. She said she was glad to, even with not knowing what she was doing. She said she loved waitressing to our group, You Feel Like Family. These were powerful words spoken by our waitress, a waitress that we love and look forward to seeing twice a month, a waitress that participates in worship with us, lifting up prayers, taking and assisting with communion. She's just as much part of our worship as everyone else. Our definition of community that it is a bit unique, I guess. It includes church with people, the homeless, the poor, a waitress, and a random, random other people who join in, and some who just listen. And in this community, people have the opportunity to empty, to let go of what they're holding on to, to let go so that there is more room for God and what God is up to. Um, I, I think it's so important to hear stories um, like that and to, um, to be in places where we're um, listening to all people. And, and um, it, for me, it's so special to hear um, the waitress being able to um, to be released from her burden by giving communion. Um, I, I just think that's so special. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. So 
So um, just a little bit about uh, the Homeless and Justice Network. Um, this is a network of about uh, just over 30 um, churches. Oh, here, I can make this bigger, sorry. Oops, nope, that was our one. There we go. Um, it's a network of about 30 churches um, and uh, the across the country. Um, and um, it's with the purpose of having a place um, to come together, to be able to support each other, to be able to listen to each other, um, to be able to be there for each other. Um, and, and especially for the ministry leaders, um, being able to have people who understand what they're going through. Um, it also um, provides uh, learning opportunities. Um, we have been doing um, um, something similar to what you guys are doing here, um, but it's called Conversation and Community, where um, there was a, a topic was chosen and people were invited to show up and be, and, um, um, talk about their own experience and their context and teach each other um, about what's going on. Um, we have some opportunities for grants or if I hear something, I'm able to pass it along to them. Um, opportunities for leadership. We work with other um, ELCA entities. So for example, um, the Homeless and Justice Network was able to um, offer some um, feedback and advice to the ELCA advocacy team for housing. Um, and that was really important um, connection that we made this year. Um, the, the leadership team within the Homeless and Justice Network are all coaches. Um, and so they offer coaching and, um, and if not coaching, then mentoring. Um, and, and so um, when that opportunity comes, I help um, connect them with the person and help them um, in that way. Um, and then just help make other connections. So um, anyone in the network can email me or call me anytime and say, I'm having this problem. Do you know somebody who could help? And I try really hard to connect them with somebody um, to help. So I, um, I'd like to show you, we have this, um, we have a little, this little book. Oh, Oh, that was weird. Oh no. All right. Um, I that I wanted to show you, which is kind of like a um um oh, sorry guys. Um like a directory of the homeless injustice. Now I will say this is, is in uh need of update. We had this isn't um, reflecting the newer um, group that has joined in the last couple years, um, but I did want to still show it to you. Um, so you can see here, um, we these are the, uh, and I'll make sure that you get a copy of this, um, Jill and Jason, so that if anybody wanted it, they can uh, they can have it because um, these are these leaders have all. Um, agreed to it, to be there uh, for you if you or somebody you know is um, looking to start a ministry that's similar um, or they want someone to talk to who will really listen to what they say. Um, all of these leaders are available um, to do that. And I wanted to lift up um, this Hephatha Lutheran Church with uh, Pastor Mary Martha. Um, I think that what from what Jill told me that um, you were able to uh, talk to her and um, or or to talk to some of her leaders um, with the topic of being young, black, and gifted. Um, and uh, Pastor Mary Martha is part of the Homeless and Justice Network, um, and so we get to hear about her ministry um, and about what they do, especially when it comes to. Um, building a community with lead-free water. Um, and I wanted to share an update with you because something really exciting happened to them uh, a couple days ago. Um, one of the leaders in her church, um, her son had um, lead poisoning several times and, and needed to be hospitalized for it. And when he um, came out of the hospital, he wrote a book and he um, um, colored the pictures himself and did all of the all of the pictures and it's so cute um, and he called himself 
the lead free superhero and he was fighting the lead monster. And uh, Vice President Kamala Harris visited their town a couple days ago and met with this mom. And the mom was able to read um, her son's book to Vice President Harris. And she loved it so much that she invited them to the White House. She said, if, when you get this book published, I want you to come to the White House and, and give it to me so that I have a copy. And so um, Pastor Mary Martha emailed um, uh, my uh, um, Ruben Duran and me and a couple of the other homeless and justice leaders, and we're working on helping her get it, uh, the book published so that they can go and do that. But I wanted to share that with you because uh, if you met her, I thought that would be really exciting for you to know. Okay. Um, so if you, if anyone else wants to know anything about the Homeless and Justice Network, I would love to tell you about it. Or if you have a ministry, ministry, or if you know somebody, or if you're interested in it, um, I would love to talk to you more about it. It is a growing group and, um, um, I am always very, very happy to talk about it. Um, I'm going to move on to the next, um, um, the other side of my job as coordinator of economic diversity is I get to work with another group called the ELCA Vulnerable and Vital Congregations Best Strategically Positioned to Respond. <laughs> it's a really big title, I know. <laughs> um, and, and oh, actually, um, before I do that, um, we wanted to just um, give a break with a discussion question. And um, the question that we had, that I had for you, um, is, let's see here, oh, I keep, um, so after hearing some of these stories, um, where do you see in your own area, um, where do you see the strength and vitality coming from, um, the marginalized communities? Um, where do you, um, where do you hear um, the, the life happening um, in, in these communities? And I think that we're just open. We, we um, decided that this would just be open if you wanted to um, just unmute yourself, if you have anything to add. Uh, Becca, yeah. this is Carlton in Philadelphia. Hey. Uh, as you know, we have the Welcome Church, which is doing a lot of work with the homeless. Uh, Reverend Violet Little, yes, um, yes. I guess a church without borders. And so we see a lot of energy and a lot of vitality right there with her ministry, with that ministry. Thank you. Becca, I will join in and, and just share something that's happening in the East Central Synod of Wisconsin. Um, so now I'm taking off my national coordinator of Coaching Cat, and I'm speaking as someone that serves in this particular um, synod. Our area is receiving over 200 of the um, Afghan refugees that have come to our country, that have escaped to our country. And we work with an entity called World Relief of the Fox Valley. And they were staying at Fort McCoy in Wisconsin, and they had been there so long that suddenly the fort said, we have to empty the fort out because we aren't able to respond to an emergency if one would happen. So suddenly all of the refugees needed somewhere else to go. And this entity that's in charge of, of resettling refugees as they come to the United States, uh, suddenly their system... The Fox Valley is not very big. It was completely flooded with these uh, refugees coming to us, and they needed the help of congregations to help them settle. And they needed very suddenly um, around 20 good neighbor teams to be formed. And so I contacted the Bishop of the East Central Synod of Wisconsin. And within a matter of a few weeks, we had over a hundred volunteers from not just the ELCA churches in the East Central Synod of Wisconsin, but um, denominational friends respond to that. And so we've met that need right now, as I speak, there are several ELCA congregations becoming like mini hospitality groups for these refugees that are settling into our community and just so many beautiful stories and, and bridges being built because the people that are coming to us 
have gifts that they're going to be sharing with our community. And because they have the stability of the friendship groups, those gifts will be able to be expressed. And I'm just so proud of the ELCA for stepping into that gap and helping to meet that need. Wow, awesome. Um, some of you shared shared in the chat um, the Pencil, Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign, yes, and the unhoused people organizing for affordable housing. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so here's that big... Um, that big title again. Um, <laughs> we spent a lot of time trying to uh, decide what this title was going to be and um, you know this is what we landed on. So here it is. But just a little history of this group. Um, so this, this group came out of uh, the beginning of the pandemic. So this was at first very quickly formed um, in order to immediately respond um, to the needs that were arising uh, early on in the pandemic. So this, we, uh, this, uh, a list uh, was made and the DEMs provided um, a list of about almost 400 um, churches. And this is how we helped, um, this is how we helped move some of the donations that were coming in um, with COVID relief. Um, then um, we decided that um, this was a just an important opportunity um, to be able to listen um, because we had kind of ideas of what you know what was going on um, and we wanted to be able to hear from people firsthand and to be able to make a space where um, people felt comfortable telling us um, their their concerns their joys um, and we also know that so many people are, uh, just prefer to kind of um, orally give um, stories um, and insights. Um, and, and so we uh, wanted to have this space. And so we had a series of listening sessions. Um, I think there were five of them where we invited um, the leaders that were on the vulnerable. At that time, it was just called Vulnerable Congregations List. Um, and, um, and for this reason, um, um, to gain insight into uh, the context of their ministry, to recognize um, and tell them face-to-face -face, um, that we value their partnerships and we value who they are, um, to get some, some facts on paper. This is what's going on. Um, and so, so we recorded it and we listened to every single piece and, and I wrote down every single thing that was said. Um, and then also in hopes that we um, could be more prepared on how to walk alongside, alongside these churches during the pandemic. Um, so these, this was some of the results um, of what we learned from that, those listening sessions. Um, these were kind of like the most commented on um, as far as concerns and, and needs. Um, so you see we have especially that technology, um, issues with technology, which actually is still uh, carrying over into, and into today. Um, ministering among youth, you know, was and, and so in some, a lot of places still is very difficult. Um, worrying about the future of their church. Um, and then many, many of uh, these ministries and communities had high populations of essential workers. And so um, the um, concerns and risks there um, were very, very big. Um, after we did that, um, we um, were, we were just so, um, felt so strongly um, the life and the vitality that was coming out of these churches and ministries and communities. And we knew that um, this needed to be something that we continued with and that we created partners with. Um, and so we formed a, um, a leadership team at the churchwide office 
um, that also includes some, um, uh, someone from the Homeless and Justice Network as well um, to kind of further develop this group. Um, and so with the following purpose, um, again, to listen and to honor the stories coming from these ministries, to be continually learning important lessons um, and to help uh, make connections. So um, we, we want to partner, um, we want to, um, um, you know, see where, where the churchwide um, fits in and, and is able to help make connections there. Um, so we talked a lot about the word vulnerable, as I'm sure some of you maybe even already thought um, as I've been talking here. <laughs> and so um, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, and before I do, you're also going to see the word resilience. Um, and I wanted to preface that by saying that um, we don't use the word resilience lightly um, at all. Um, it is true um, that in the face of the crisis and the pandemic, um, in, in the face of systemic racism, um, these communities are resilient. Um, however, I, I always like to couple that word um, with uh, conveying the commitment um, to address and change those systems that create the need for being resilient in the first place. Um, and so I just want to say that 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 is what I mean when I say the word resilient. Um, so as we go into that, this word vulnerable, um, we, um, we th this was written the following uh, couple pages. Um, I know there's a lot of words there, but I'm just going to give bullet points. Um, uh, this was written by the leadership team, the um, uh, vulnerable and vital congregations leadership team. Um, so Jesus himself was vulnerable. Um, Jesus had a propensity uh, for the marginalized, and we use this word vulnerable in hopes that we can name this issue um, and that we can align our purpose with Christ's purpose. Um, vulnerable in this context does not mean uh, dying. It does not mean weak. Um, in fact, uh, we see life and vitality in many of these ministries. Um, and maybe instead what that means is that our traditional measures of what a healthy church looks like can't really be applied to, to these ministries. Um, for example, um, I'm going to turn the page here. Um, so, for example, stewardship, right? Um, offerings. So maybe a vulnerable and vital congregation is not able to be fully sustained by the offerings of their members and their community. Um, that might not be in the cards for them. That might not ever um, be possible. However, um, at the start of the pandemic, we were just, it was very, very obvious that these churches were positioned um, to respond to crisis um, better than a um, suburban, you know, uh, white congregation um, were able to do. I mean, they they just um, they knew people. They had the partnerships. They had the connections. Um, they were able to place people here and place people there, and and they were good at it. I'll just say that they were good at it. They knew what to do. Um, and they were able to lead in that way. Um, so it just is possibly a mind, a mind shift change. Um, it, it's, um, you know, typically, you know, the, what are those, um, what are those ways that we measure, right? Um, baptisms and offering and, um, church size, um, and new members, um, so those type of measurements um, maybe aren't going to apply, but we still see life and we still see vitality, we still see strength, and that is worth so much. Um, so this is um, what our, our group talks a lot about, is how do we move forward with that um, kind of new definition and, and, and change definitions and 
um, change the word healthy, um, change what that might look like. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then um, after that, um, we decided to uh, update the list um, because our hope is to figure out how to, um, uh, the best way that we can listen, the best way that we can learn is we're going to have to build some relationships. And so we wanted to um, kind of uh, um, give the opportunity to, for, for the leaders to um, um, voice what's going on after this was about like a year after uh, the first listening session. So um, we updated the list and with these criteria. Now, this criteria, um, it was not a checklist at all. So this isn't like, okay, if they didn't meet all five of these, um, they couldn't be on the list. No, not at all. This was just to start dreaming, to start visioning. Um, we wanted the DEMs to think outside of the box, like um, to kind of think about churches where um, they might have been written off because they don't meet those, those traditional metrics, um, but they might have um, a lot of leaders. They might have a lot of leaders within their youth group that are doing awesome things. Um, they might be responding to um, the pandemic in different ways. Um, so we, this was just a starting off point uh, to be able to dream into um, uh, building this group. Um, okay, so after, after that, I'm fast forwarding now and, and we, we refined the list. Um, we invited um, a certain group to um, take a survey. Um, and I wanted to focus on just to end, just tell you one part of this survey. Um, and so I wanted to tell you a little, show you a little bit about the partnerships and what the partnerships looked like within this group. Um, so you, it, you can see that just about, you know, almost 50, 50, um, about just under 50% um, have over six partnerships. And some of that includes more than 20, more than 30, um, a lot of partnerships. And then the other half um, has six or less. Um, these are some of the things that they're doing. Um, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of things going on, a lot, a lot of things going on. Um, lots of food ministries, uh, lots of community ministries, um, lots of being outside of the church building, um, prison ministries, um, lots of ministries with people experiencing homelessness. I'll let you read through that just to give you a second. This just kind of gives, gives us a glimpse into uh, the work that's going on in these churches and ministries. Okay, so um, um, one kind of, um, uh, there. this also had, uh, the survey had, uh, was multiple choice and then also some written portion. And so, um, some of the things that we were learning when it came to partnerships, um, we were able to kind of um, mash up with uh, some of the things that we've learned from the ELCA, um, sufficient and sustainable livelihood for all. Um, it's like a, um, it's not a technically a social statement, but it is a, a ELCA statement. Um, and I really, really, really recommend reading it. It is so wonderful. It was written 20 years ago, but it's still pretty um, applicable to today. Um, and you can just find it on the ELCA website. Um, but when we're considering our partnerships, um, are we uh, addressing creatively and courageously the complex causes of poverty? Are we providing opportunities for dialogue, learning, and strategizing among people of different economic situations? Um, are we giving more to relieve issues of poverty and investing more in initiatives to reduce poverty? And then um, this last one, I really, really um, am borrowing from the Homeless and Justice Network because this is just, this is uh, the big lesson I've learned from them. Are we acknowledging the image of God and promoting dignity in all people? 
while authentically walking alongside each other in mutuality using a with, not for attitude. Um, so there it is. <laughs> So that is, um, that's all I really have to say and, and share with you about um, what the things that my team has been working on. Um, and I, I did have one uh, kind of ending question to discuss with you all um, in your own life and work and, and, the, and, and what you see and the people around you. Um, do you see any need for that type, this type of healthy mindset change when it comes to some of the things that we talked about? I'm going to stop sharing here. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, yes, if you need to, yeah, I can ask that again. Um, so in some of those kind of mindset changes, um, oh, sure, I'll just write the question in the chat. But um, do you, when, especially when it comes to the word um, vulnerable or when it comes to thinking about, um, you know, what is a, what does a healthy congregation look like um, or a, you um, doing ministry with, not for, um, you know, those kinds of mindset changes. Do you see in your own context any need for that? You know, we talked about earlier Gen Z as we started this, and um, I have three Gen Zer children. And this is the stuff that's important to them. And we we might we have our churches on a, a, a college campus, and this is what gets um, them excited and wanting to do something within the congregation. Um, you know, people are always like, "Well, where are the young people? Where are the young people?" Well, um, listening to what's important, and then following where God is moving, um, I see that passion in the, that Gen Z um, age kids. You know, my kids won't necessarily go to church with me, but if I, we do a service project or if we yeah. do something that makes a difference in the world, that's where they see God, not necessarily in the stained glass windows that are in our building. Yeah, that really aligns with that report, with the, uh, the Gen Z report. Yeah, absolutely. Right now for us, uh, our congregation is located in an area where we are working with 30-somethings and their toddlers. And our church also is a big supporter of um, I Heart Harvest which uses donated help fields, et cetera, to grow food for our food bank in the county. And it's been an interesting conjunction of, of those two things uh, that have seemed to be part of the vitality in our congregation. And so I listen you know, to what you're saying but listening for something is probably a very different context than what most of you folks within the city might uh, engage in. But um, still, it, it, it is about relationships. You mentioned relationships. And it is about the way we, we listen and we accentuate the positives and the strengths of everybody. And we use those to just kind of um, move on and stay vital. And, and I appreciated what you were saying about the resilience, because that's another thing that I've been um, kind of processing in my head as I observe the different generations, because the rest of the folks, for the most part, are over 50. Um, and so 
resilience and vitality has been something they've been struggling with. And I think you gave words to something that all of us have been trying to, to find out. So I look forward to sharing some of that in my, my sermon at our uh, annual congregational meeting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. Beck, I appreciate the fact that you that you guys combine um, vulnerability and uh, vitality, because I think in a lot of cases that's what you find. You find, especially in the context in which I am in Philadelphia, Central Philadelphia Conference, the congregations are vital, but they're all vulnerable because they're so small. COVID has simply um, magnified the problem and accelerated the problems that have already existed for a long time. And uh, so um, a lot of them, a lot of the congregations like my own, they're hanging on by a thread, but if they were, if they were to somehow close, the communities would really suffer because they're counting on the food banks, the Narcotics Anonymous uh, gap meeting places, the, their voting places, their, they have after school programs, some of them have preschools and all that kind of stuff. And so they serve uh, a real, really vital interest in our communities in which we serve, but they are vulnerable. I, I enjoy hearing and uh, experiencing the ministry with um, concept. Um, in my, my setting, um, it's it's somewhat challenging. Um, I'm in a similar setting, considered vulnerable and vital. Um, so, with the limited resources of our congregation and time, it's difficult sometimes to facilitate. Uh, a ministry that fully includes um, ministry with those we're serving. Um, whereas I, I look at some examples um, of some of the uh, more higher functioning congregations and oh, their ministry with is such, it's so outstanding um, because they have air conditioning <laughs> and they have their conditions um, kind of, um, um, it, it, it complements the ministry with and there's there's space for that, um, um, and the and the, it reduces the anxiety level uh, in ways that allow more ministry with um, at one of our um, shelters in the area, which, which is uh, I think it's the largest men's shelter in in, in Ohio, with their Metropolitan Ministry, they really use that ministry with concept, and the individuals who stay there, they they take care of that that place and they move from being unemployed to working while staying there to coming back. And sometimes after buying or building a home, coming back and helping others um, train to do the same. Um, mm -hmm. So I really like those, those um, inclusive ministry with um, concepts. I really thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing. Becca, hearing your presentation, um, especially the statistics that you showed of all the different things that were happening through these, and, and I'm with my brother Carlton, I love that that word vital is right up alongside vulnerable, because I'm wondering how many of, of us have heard our congregation say, oh, we don't have enough money to do that. We don't, we don't have the resources to do this, that, or the other thing. And, and a congregation that, be, that, that could be considered vulnerable, right? Look at all the ways that they're engaging. And um, you lifted up Hepatha Lutheran Church. I've had the, the extreme privilege of serving there several times because I live close enough to go down there and be with them. And this is a congregation that when Pastor Mary Martha was called there, she was called there to close that congregation down. Right, yeah. And after two weeks, she realized this church yes. is a hub of survival yeah. for vulnerable people in the community. And she went head to head with the synod staff and said, basically, I refuse to do that. <laughs> 
And so here she is like two plus decades later, still serving. And Hephatha has become uh, and has remained and has become even more this, this vital hub of life for the community, helping to give fresh starts for people. And I've been in the congregation where where members like newly released from prison are brought up front and prayed for and celebrated. And here's new life for you. And, and we're with you. We're praying for you. I mean, you can't, you can't witness that and, and walk away the same. Um, it, it, it just is absolutely inspiring. Yeah. So thank you for that reminder. It's, it's not all about how much we have been going around in the till that lets us do the work of God. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me <laughs> and for um, and and for listening and for um, your amazing comments and what you had to share to out loud or in the chat. I really appreciate it. And if I'll, I'll write my email in the chat right now, and um, and please reach out to me if you have if for any reason, even just to say hi. <laughs> So Becca, I heard at least one person say that they were going to access some of this information for a sermon. I'm wondering if you will give Jason permission to post the slides that you shared on sure. our website. Oh, sure. I can um, um, share the, um, the slides and also um, I can share with you the uh, Homeless and Justice Directory um, and... Um, I can send the link also to uh, Pastor Matthew's um, story about the uh, truck stop. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, I thought I heard someone say my name. Wanting to, to in, inter interrupt and ask a question. I do see an additional question, and Becca, I don't know if you feel prepared to speak into it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to discern the difference between mercy and justice. I wonder what thoughts you have off the top of your head, friend Becca, on that on that topic. And and I leave it to the room to also. I mean, this is part of what we do together, right? In courageous leadership, is we wrestle with stuff together. So, what are our thoughts around that distinction between mercy and justice? I'm guessing, if I'm not wrong, that that's referring to the like with not for. Um, so, which sometimes I hear it explained like the difference between. Um, um, like charity and justice. Is that the right angle, Margie, that you were kind of thinking? Or maybe when people talk about it. Yeah, versus equity. I think so. Yeah. We're, we're, Lutherans are real good at doing mercy. Yes. And, and the charity work. Yeah. Um, in my view, we're not so good at really addressing the justice issue. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, and, and also, I mean, and I, I, hear, I heard you too, Jason, um, you know, like the equity as opposed to um, um, equality. Equality, yeah. Yeah, and I invite Tim to speak. Um, these are excellent comments that Tim has as well. Yeah, please do, Tim. Yeah, uh, I'm Tim Seitz Brown, and I'm on the land of the Susquehannock in South Central Pennsylvania here. And um, I'm a participant or faith leader in the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. And when I hear the conversation, I was thinking um, Dr. King uh, in 1960 wanted to raise up a nonviolent army of the poor. And like his, uh, idea is even more timely now because prior to the pandemic we had 140 poor and low-income Americans that were like one financial emergency away from disaster and then the pandemic hit and then we started calling service workers essential workers but then we didn't really pay them as essential workers so there's where we're falling into the justice thing and then, um, you know, over the pandemic or over the course of the last two years, you know, there's been a widening gap of uh, inequality. And then, you know, as we know, um, 
you know, a lot of people are being kicked out, like the uh, the eviction uh, moratorium change. So, uh, you know, one of the thoughts or one of being in the poor people's campaign, the idea is to mobilize the poor, like as a, a force within this community to have a voice. And so we talk about um, that we needed, we changed the narrative by changing the narrator. And I think that's, you know, complementary to what you, you know, you're talking about vital and vulnerable. I think that's talking about that. And then talking about the justice and mercy, I very much agree. Like our imagination is limited to the mercy part. And what I see this group, uh, what I wanted to thank you all for was uh, funding, you know, the imagination of the church, because a lot of, uh, of our churches, you know, all we've ever known or had the bandwidth for is, you know, for the mercy things, you know, the doing for kind of things. So mm. I'd like okay. to raise Go ahead. Um, the thought that a change in attitude, we need mercy in our attitudes in order to pursue justice. Yeah. So the judgment of people, well, they, they're poor because they didn't do such and such. It's their own fault. Right. That we have to change that attitude in order to get involved with the justice. Amen. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. What that's uh, you know, saying is that we're fighting poverty, not the poor. We're not blaming the poor for or mm -hmm. people experiencing poverty and homelessness. Um, it's the structures. Thank you, Tim. Melissa. Well, I was just, as you all were talking, it made me think about, you know, like you're saying church, we're good at doing four, but really it's actually changing the power shift because if we're the ones that are doing four, then we have the power. And when we come into relationships with people, and hear and listen to them, then the power and, and learn the power, I would hope the power shift comes to where then we're equal. We're not, I have something you need and here I am, but actually we all need each other. We need what you have as much as you need what I have. Um, I agree. I think that's probably one of the reasons why it's so much harder, um, because for for various reasons, you know, there is some level of, um, you know, giving power away, um, and and you know, yeah. There's there's a whole. I mean, there's books and books. I, I'm not, you know, an expert or anything. Um, and but. I think that you hit it, you hit it on the nose. I think that that is one of the reasons why. And even, I mean, truthfully, truth, even within the this group, the vulnerable and vital congregations, I mean, that list that I showed you with all of the um, ministries that they're doing, it was, a, it's a huge list. There's lots of things. You will see more often the higher numbers in those um, like food ministries as a, and lower numbers once you get into the justice ministries um, where, and, and so even, you know, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard work, it's harder, there's more to lose. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's a conversation worth having and talking about with our ministries, definitely. Amen, Becca, it is a conversation mm -hmm. worth having. And there's someone who showed us the way when Jesus engaged his earthly ministry, he showed us what this looked like to walk with those on the margins, to listen, to love, and to engage in those acts of mercy, but also 
Jesus left the individual empowered to take their next steps. That's one of the reasons why I'm just such a proponent of coaching because the coaching posture is all about, I, if I'm accompanying you as a coach, I look at you as creative, as whole, as resource to do exactly what you need to do. Our mantra is that, that you are beloved of God. You have been gifted by God and you are invited by God into God's work of loving and healing the world. That is true around the world. Anyone that enters a coaching conversation with us is being looked at with those eyes and with that belief in our hearts as coaches. And that completely changes the paradigm. Someone knows if you look at them as less than and, and, and that we come in as the, oh, we're pouring our resources down on you. That's very, very different. That's one of the things I've appreciated about the training that we've received um, with World Relief as volunteers walking with the Afghan refugees is that it's, it's really about acknowledging that we are um, evening the power differential and that we are excited to receive these individuals into our community and that we do so with a posture of great expectation of the gifts that they're bringing to us. So friends, thank you for this rich discussion today. Becca, thank you again for sparking this conversation. I invite each of us to think about how might we take what we have heard today and really think about how does this intersect with the faith community that I journey with? How does this intersect with the community that we're placed within as a faith community? And what's a faithful step that I might be taking? And our friend, um, Brother Mark Carlson, has put um, a long post. I, I encourage you to read that. Friends, we will be here again next week. Next week, we are breaking out in our um, topic rooms almost right away at the beginning. And so we encourage you to come. Those um, topics will be hosted once again by our ELCA coaches. And as we leave this space today, I want to remind you again that the work that you do is so valuable, is so important. I do see the light of Christ shining through each and every one of you. You are beloved. So thank you. We're here to walk with you. Let us know if you need the services of a coach or your faith community. We will connect you. God bless you, friends. Thank you for this time. Thank you again, Becca. Thank you, thank you so much. Great conversation.